we welcome you to the house of the Lord here at First Baptist today. We appreciate you braving the uh, storms this morning, but we thank the Lord for the rain. And as he comes to sustain us and nourish us, we pray that you will be nourished as we do worship the one true living God. You're welcome, you're loved, and you're accepted in this place. For too long, I've wandered. For too long, I've roamed. I've looked for fulfillment, but found no home. My heart, my soul grieving. I've struggled with believing, buying into all of this deceiving. And the lies keep pouring in. They told me I'd be okay. If I made enough money at the end of the day, if I got that promotion, if I got that new car, if I got that house with that dog in the yard, I'd be fine. But they lied, because somewhere inside, I'm empty. I need more than what I have, and I'm not even looking for material things. I've had enough of that. I need something deeper something real or something that's more than what I'm feeling because right now I'm lost honestly I mean I've heard that Jesus died for me but what does that even mean doesn't everybody die what makes this man so special what makes him what I need what makes his blood more powerful when he bleeds I want to know I want to understand so I'm here on this day to find out I mean, is it true? Did he really raise from the grave? Did he really heal the blind and the lame? Did he really make the world? Did he really calm the seas? If this is true, then he is what I need. So on this day, I choose to believe. Not in a fairy tale, not in a lie, but in hope. In hope that he really did rise. In faith that he is who he says he is. In faith that he rose. In faith he ascended and is preparing us a home. If all this is true, then I want to know him. looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places. We've all been there and perhaps you're struggling even today, knowing there's more, feeling empty, but not quite sure how to fill that empty space. Oh friends, that space is meant for Jesus. And he continues to seek and to save those who are lost, those who are broken, those who are empty. Jesus calls us into relationship, calling us out of the darkness and into his glorious day. I invite you to stand as we sing, as we celebrate the day of salvation, this glorious day.
God, creator of all, thank you for creating us wonderfully, knitting us perfectly, and putting inside each of us a space created just for you to dwell. And at just the right time, you call us by name, seeking to occupy that empty space, calling us into relationship. Oh, Lord, give us ears like Samuel to hear you calling. Spirit of God, we welcome you into our worship today. Open our hearts. May we be receptive. And we pray that you would move freely amongst us this hour. Father in heaven, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who gave his all so that we could experience the glorious day of salvation. We lift our prayer in his name, our Savior, our Lord. Amen. We turn to Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10, to find words of hope and promise. It reads, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, 
your righteousness to the upright in heart. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. This morning we sing a gospel hymn that reminds us that when nothing else can help, love lifted me. Testament reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 4. I'll begin reading from verse number 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So the question that we must ask ourselves this morning, as followers of Jesus Christ, is how we love the world around us, how we treat our neighbor, how we care for the needs of others. 
and how we give is it a reflection of Jesus Christ in our lives because each one of us are invited to be a part of God's journey in reaching the world with the love of Jesus Christ and so this morning as we worship we invite you to worship God through giving we have offering plates around our sanctuary in which you can give in person we have online giving opportunities text giving or you can mail your tithes and your offerings in but whatever way you choose to give let us continue to ask ourselves are our lives a reflection of the love that Jesus Christ has given us so freely in his death on the cross let's go to God now in prayer Gracious and loving God, we thank you that in our brokenness, you did not give up on us. And as we come into your presence this morning and worship you, may we be reminded that it is through Jesus Christ that we are made complete, through accepting him as our Savior, and through going out into this world and sharing that great love with those around us. So now as we worship you through giving, may you bless all that is given. And may we continually be reminded, God, that it is not the amount that is given, but it is the spirit and attitude in which we give that is most important. For it's in the name of Christ that we do pray. Amen. You thought I was worth saving
I invite you to turn with me now for our scripture reading found in John chapter 15. Today's sermon is entitled, The Moving Love of Jesus. The Moving Love of Jesus. As we encounter and interact with this scripture today, um, when Jesus first spoke these words, he's facing the crucifixion. He has um, triumphantly entered Jerusalem. He's washed his disciples' feet. He is teaching them. And he's coming to this place where he's going to teach them and share with them some of the most important things before he is crucified. He has taught them about the true vine in the earlier verses of this chapter. And then beginning with verse 9, he reveals uh, just what a level that he's called us to as being children of God, servants, and friends. Reading from verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I wanted to read those prefaced words because, you know, sometimes when we come to church, we have lots of different things on our mind, on our heart, directions. Sometimes our worship services are geared to, to celebrating, sometimes to instructing, sometimes to teaching, always to celebrating the Word of God and the will of God, His place in our lives. And today, as we think about the moving love of Jesus, and as we seek to become more fully formed followers of Christ, sometimes we probably do well to make the bulk of our worship experience uh, about celebrating the amazing love of God. It is a love that's not static. It is a love that is moving in our hearts, that is moving to the hearts of others. It is an active love that we're called to, a love that, that considers being like Jesus above everything else. And so Jesus gives us some insight that is unique here. He's telling us these things. He's telling us that he has loved us the way the Father has loved you to give us some inside information, if you will. And verse 12 continues. He tells us this, that Christ's joy may be in us and that our joy would be complete, not halfway not just to salve when we're in really down times, but this is to be the kind of joy that comes from our salvation that is with us all the time. And Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. In verse 9, Jesus says, I've loved you the way the Father loves me. And now we're to love others the way that Jesus loves us, which makes us, which conforms us to the image of our Father. Jesus teaches us these wondrous words that we've heard, that we believe, that even society in our nation where sometimes folks are unchurched or unbelievers, they still recognize this truth, this eternal command that Jesus lived out. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. The word there can be translated slaves as well. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father. And I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name, and this is my command. Love each other. Let's pray together. Father, your kingdom is so vast and wondrous and deep and rich. And in our journey with you, O oh God, in our journey of faith through this life, you've called us to friendship. 
You've called us to bear fruit. You've commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love others the way that you've loved us. Lord, you have set the bar above the nature of our sinful selves. You've set the bar above the standards of our society and our globe. Lord, if you've set the standard in your heart that you call to us as your children and servants to bear your image, to bear fruit for you. And Lord, you've revealed to us the secrets of the kingdom. Help us to embrace this secret that is to be proclaimed openly that we are to love one another with the love of Christ, which is the love of God, to love without boundaries, to love without prejudice, to love without strings or conditions, but to love selflessly and self-sacrificially. For this is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus does. And it is what Jesus commands. Help us, O oh God, to embrace the moving love of Jesus this day. For we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Moved. We are moved by the love of God. I don't know a bit about you, but I, as I read this scripture, I'm reminded that you are a child of the King. You are highly favored. You are unique. And God, when he uh, sent his only begotten son to save the world, I have no doubt that he had you in mind. I have no doubt that Jesus knew you before you were formed within your parents. I have no doubt that he loves us with an everlasting love so much that when he could have done anything else, he hung upon that cross to pay the price for our sins. Sometimes as we listen to the hymns, as we read these scriptures, it is only love that could have lifted us. When our souls were in danger, when, when we were outside of the love of God, as Romans 5, 8 says that God commends his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is that kind of moving love that we experience as followers of Christ. You are a winner. You are more than a conqueror. You, if you have received Jesus Christ, his intention for you is that his joy would be made complete because you understand the agape love of God. What it means to you that God was so moved by his love for you that he gave Jesus to us. That's moving. I think nothing in this life moves my heart more than to see sacrificial Unconditional love. I was at a conference some years ago, and a lady stood up. She was a striking African-American lady, and uh, she has a wonderful ministry in our nation, and she was speaking about how Christ had been modeled to her. She was the child of a single mother, and as she began to grow up and mature, she noticed that by the age of six or seven that she had never seen her mother in short sleeves or anything like that, that no matter the weather, hot as blazes or cool, she'd wear long sleeves, sweaters, and she was always dressed nicely. They were not of means, but what they wore was clean. It was pressed. It was nice as they could afford. And as this young lady uh, was moving towards her eighth birthday, her mother took her to a local shopping establishment to get her a birthday dress. And they went throughout the store, and finally they found a dress, and... The child was moved by it, wanted it, told her mother, and it was on the, the cusp of what the mother could afford as she raised her daughter on her own. And she said, well, honey, if that's the, the dress you want, then we'll get it. Let's get you some other accessories to go with it. And the mother held the dress as the child went and chose a few other things, some new shoes, accessories for the dress. They were both joyous and when they went to to check out to pay for their purchases the mother reached out and put the dress on the counter when she did the uh, blouse that she was wearing rose up a bit and the the lady who was to ring up their sales gasped 
And her daughter saw horrific scars on her mother's hand and realized she had never seen this. And the daughter was embarrassed that the cashier was taken aback. And she began to cry and to cry. And the mother quickly pulled her sleeve down, paid for the purchase, and took her out and said, Honey, I'm so sorry. And the child was crying almost unstoppably. And she said, Mother, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. The lady was horrified by your scars. What are the scars? And she said, You've been keeping this from me. And the mother pulled up her sleeves a bit, both of her arms. They were very, very scarred. Had gone through many surgeries of plastic um, surgery repair. And the little girl was just embarrassed, a little angry. Mama, why didn't you tell me? You know, I could have helped you to, to hide this. You know, folks will be repelled. And the mother said, well, honey, that's why I've done this. I've hidden my scars because I didn't want you to be embarrassed. She said, I'm also a little ashamed of them. They're not um, becoming. So that's why I've worn these long sleeves, these sweaters. I would never want you to be embarrassed. The little girl was sniffling. She said, well, I am. I'm embarrassed. How did you get those? And the mother said, well, when you were just an infant, we lived in a small apartment, and I woke up in the night, and the apartment was in flames. It was on fire, and your crib was in another room closer to the window, and that's where the flames were between me and you. And I, my first instinct was to run to the door and to hope to get help. But she said, I couldn't bear to th think that if we couldn't get help here that you would perish in the flames alone. And so I decided if we were going to perish, we were going to perish together. And she braved those flames. When she got to the crib, she got up her infant child. And as the flames had grew higher, she went back through those flames, went through them, got her daughter safely to the door, down the many steps and out to safety as the fire department was battling the fire. And she said, my arms were on fire, but you were safe. And as soon as we got you to safety, they took me in. That's what these are. And this now adult minister of the king said, at that point, I realized, even though um, I had been ashamed of my mother's scars, that she was willing literally to lay down her life for mine that she would rather die than for me to die alone in that fire. Well, it's not a far jump for you to understand the love of God when we see the kind of love of a mother for a child and we hear the words of Jesus saying, I want you to, to understand that you're loved the way that my Father loves me. That Christ is saying to you and to me, and we celebrate that today, that he loves us so much that he would have no barriers, that he would die on the cross for our sins while we were yet sinners. Is that not a moving love? Are we not moved by the love of a mother who would brave death and bear the scars for saving a child? And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. I've shared before, but it's a great insight. When I was... Still in college, I heard a preacher say that the only man-made thing in heaven, and when he said that, you know, my ears perked up. What, what thing is in heaven that man could create? He hooked me and he said, the only man-made things in heaven are the scars upon Jesus' hands and his feet and the ribbon side and the bruises that he received and the beatings that he took on my behalf and the thorns that were pressed on his brow. And Jesus knows he's about to face this, and yet he says greater love has nobody than to lay down his life for his friends. And they're about to see it in an eternity-changing way when those who had the fortitude went to Calvary's mount. And they saw him on the cross. They don't know it now, but they're going to be shown the moving love of God in a way that no one ever could no one ever did before. No one has ever done since. That the king of glory would love us so much that he would lay down his life for me and for you. And yet he had the power to conquer death and hell and the grave and to give us an inheritance of our father's business. 
I'm moved by the love of God. I've been moved literally and figuratively by the love of God. Emotionally, informationally, reading the scriptures, seeing the life of Christ, hearing his words, hearing the testimony of those who would die for him because they would say, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar is Lord. To know of that, to be moved by that kind of story of love, but then to experience it and to accept that kind of love, a love that a father would have for a son beyond the love that a, a human parent could have for their child, so is God's love for you. And it moves us emotionally and spiritually. And eternally it has moved us from children of darkness into children of light. Friend, you are more than a conqueror today. I know that we all have difficulties and challenges and troubles and we wake up to thunderstorms and we think of the clouds of darkness around in this world in war and violence and pestilence in hatred for one another in thoughts and attitudes that are not of Christ. And yet, the love of God constrains us to understand that God so loved you that he died on the cross to save you and me. Oh, it's, it's good news, friends. God's love moves us because we understand just a little bit about how much God loves you. And the world may be trying to drag you down or the things of life, but hear this, friends. God loves you. And he's looking for us to understand that we're not just slaves or servants, but that he calls us friend. He calls us friend. Read with me in the scriptures as we're moved by God's love. Here's my command. Love each other as I've loved you. Don't love like the world loves that can take it away. Don't love like those who only love people when they do what they want or when they're pleasing to them. But the love of God loves us when we're at our most unlovely or when we may think we're at the best. And we're to love like that. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. Love Agape love, the love of Christ, moves us beyond simply reveling and wondrously reveling in the love that God has for us. But when we truly embrace the love of God, it moves us to love others with the love of Christ. It's the quality of agape that has no conditions, that we love, as Pastor BJ read earlier, because God loved us first. God loved us first. You know, we should never get to that place that we think we're doing God a favor by loving him, by adoring him, by praising him, by worshiping him, by being faithful to his command and to his kingdom to do the things he's called us to do. I'm not doing God a favor. I'm at best being obedient, at best understanding that he's continually inviting me to go from servant to son, to friend. He is the friend of sinners. We sing that song, and it's a great one. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Jesus knew what he was getting into when he saved you and when he saved me. He knew we weren't perfect. He knew we were sinful, and yet he loved us so much that he would die for us. The love of Christ moves us to love others with a selfless and self-sacrificial love. <clears throat> I don't know everything that heaven will be like when we get there, but I know it'll be perfect. I know it'll be beautiful. I know there'll be no pain, no sin, no darkness. I know that we'll be reunited with loved ones. Most of all, I know that we'll be in the very presence of God, in the presence of God. And I sometimes in my sentimentality, I, this is not theology class, this is just my sin, sentimental thoughts, but I do believe that we'll get to see so many of uh, all, perhaps all the patriarchs and the heroes of our faith from the scriptures and also from our experience. 
And I'd like to have a conversation when I get there with the fellow who's already there. He was famous, but I wasn't taken by his fame. I was taken by his faith. His pa it was Pastor E.V. Hill who pastored a very prominent, large um, Baptist church in Los Angeles. And some decades ago, when there was a great deal of tension and violence and racial unrest, economic um, problems, riots, deaths going on, Pastor Evie Hill took a real stance, not to any particular community, but to all of Los Angeles and preached the love of Christ and to love our enemies and to be forgiving and most of all to be loving. And how he thought that the violence could only end when we began to live like Jesus lived and love like Jesus loved. And because of his love for enemies as well as love for those who loved him, Evie Hill had a target upon him, and he was called one night by someone to threaten him. They were anonymous, of course, and said that if you don't quit preaching reconciliation, if you don't quit preaching God's love, we're going to kill you too. We're going to bomb you. Already one prominent anti-violence African-American pastor had already been killed. And the voice on the phone said, you're next if you keep doing this. And Evie Hill talked with his wife and said, you know, we'll contact the police, but they've told us to be a little more vigilant um, and be careful about things. He said one of the pastors had perished from a, a bomb placed in his car. And when Evie, Evie Hill told his wife and the, the police officers cautioned them as a couple and as a family some things to do, he felt a little better. And after they had met with uh, law enforcement and had been told some of the do's and don'ts. The next morning, E.V. Hill said he woke up in his bed and he, he reached over instinctively to, to caress his wife and thank God for the morning, thank God for her. And she was gone. And he said to this group of uh, ministers, I, she usually uh, um, allowed me to get up first. I got up first and would go about the day and then she'd get up later. But now she's already gone, so I went to the garage and the car was gone and I went to the front window and I saw there my wife came driving up in my car and uh, she came inside and he said to her you know what were you doing and she said to him and I quote I just wanted to be sure any bomb would not explode on you he said he was angry with her at first but then he realized that it was her love that moved her to act. She was willing to lay down her life for her husband. She was willing to drive the car that had been targeted to bomb him. And though she was not bombed, she was willing to take that risk. That kind of love moves me. That kind of love, I think, moves God. It moves the people who have been changed, transformed by the love of God, moving them from children of darkness into children of light and motivating them to do as Jesus did, to be willing to lay down our lives for those that we love, for those that we're called to love, for our neighbor. Last week, we preached about, we celebrated the Good Samaritan. And I asked you, many of you, to uh, send me, if you were willing to entrust it to me, <clears throat> examples of good Samaritans in your life. And I thank you for the amazing stories that were sent to me. <clears throat> and many of them. One in particular that I haven't asked permission to share, but I will. Involved folks who, when they showed the love of Christ, it was not just in the twinkling of an eye. It's not just something that was temporary, but some so loved God and loved their neighbor that they committed and spent their entire life serving God by serving someone else. Serving those who couldn't serve themselves. Laying down their lives because they considered the needs of others higher than their own. The stories were amazing. One in particular of a man who learned of, in the depression, of the death of a father to which there were many children 
And rather than see that family in want and that widow trying to raise all those children do, during the Depression, they sought the Lord. He felt called to take care of them. He married the widow and raised the children. During the Depression, he adopted those children. He embraced those children. He lived out the love of God to us that moves us, that we're taken by. How does a person do that? How does a woman brave the flames to save someone else? How does a person put their life on hold in order to dedicate it to someone else for decades for the entirety of their life? They do it out of the love of Christ, out of agape. In these very passage, I'm sure that Jesus in his first hearers was playing on words. He says, I've shown you agape. I've lived agape to you. I'm calling you to agape. And then when he gets to, before I've called you servants, now we call you phylos, phylos, friends. And there's a love that's among friends, phileo. As we know, Greek is, is so wondrous in the, the definitions of different types of love, whether it's we love a sport or we love a particular food, we use those terms, or we love a particular ball team, and then we say we love our spouse, or we love our children, or we love God. Vast differences. And agape, as the scriptures tell us in John's letters, God is agape. The very definition of agape is God. And so we are so moved by that that God is love, that he's agape. And now he's called us from just being friends or comrades or, or having a BFF to understanding that we're called to have the love of God for people. It moves us to be changed. It moves us to embrace the command of God. That if we're going to be like him, if we're going to bear fruit that will last, that does not perish, then this is what we're to do. We are to love each other. We cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love our neighbor whom we can see, the Scriptures teach us. We're to be changed by Christ. We're to be commanded by Jesus in verse 17. Agape each other. Don't just give lip service, but live out heart service to one another. What does it mean to be commanded by Christ? <clears throat> I was reading a book that I don't recall the title to right offhand, but within it, a story is told by Joe Lowe that uh, he was uh, told this story by his pastor. There was a gentleman by the name of Bill who, when World War II broke out and in December of 1941, he joined the Navy. He had been a, uh, a sailor and a captain all of his life, and he was commanding a troop ship, troop ships that would ferry American soldiers to England and then to be prepared to be in the action of World War II. And there were many times that he would be on convoys in the North Atlantic, and there would be destroyers, there would be protective ships, but uh, they were always braving the wolf pack the U-boats uh, of Germany. And there was one occasion where he'd had some liberty and they were docked in his hometown of Boston. And so he went to uh, visit his pastor, Reverend Stidger. And as they began to visit together, Reverend Stidger said, Bill, we're praying for you. We're praying for your safety, for your skill as you ferry men and material to the Allied war effort. We're praying for the safety of the men that you having your charge, we're praying for those who protect you. He said, but Bill, would you tell me, and I quote, the most exciting experience you've had so far as the war was geared up as the invasion of France had not yet taken place. And Bill hesitated for just a moment, and it was not that he couldn't decide, but it was that he told Reverend Stitcher, Stitcher what he was about to share with him. It was a bit difficult to put into words because it was so wonderful and yet so sacred. And he said, this experience is etched upon my soul as we were taking 
hundreds and thousands of men on this particular troop ship. There were other troop ships. There was a protocol of how you were to move in the zigzag patterns to England. But occasionally one of the U-boats would slip through the protection. Bill said, well, we were always on guard. We have uh, sentries everywhere. We have eyes searching the seas. And he said, as we were looking uh, for any perils, he said, I was horrified as I saw a submarine in the distance to our east. And then I saw the telltale signs of a torpedo headed straight for us. He said, the distance between the submarine and the transport ship was so small he didn't have any time to change course, and so he went over the intercom and cried out, Boys, this is it. We're going down. And as he looked and tried to, to, to maneuver in some way this huge, cumbersome, lumbering ship, he knew the torpedo was going to hit. And in his peripheral vision, he saw this smaller, much smaller vessel, a destroyer, speeding and over the communications he heard the commander say full speed ahead and that destroyer gave it all of its power and speed and ultimately shielded that transport as it was torpedoed hit amidships the tor torpedo did exploded it did such damage to the hull and the integrity of the ship that it went down very quickly every man perished but the transport ship with thousands of sailors arrived safely in England. For a long time after he shared this story, Bill was silent. And then he said to his beloved pastor, Reverend Stidger, the skipper of that destroyer was my best friend. He was quiet for a while again, and then he said slowly, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that has even more special meaning for me now. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. When John Lowe tells that story, I'm reminded that Jesus' love is linked to obedience. If we do what he commands, then we are his friends. And our friendship with God calls us to be like him. I wonder at that. I marvel at that. I'm moved to celebration. I'm moved to worship when I think about Jesus taking my place on that cross. It's a moving love of Jesus that comes to our hearts and saves us and transforms us into his, not just servants, but his friends. To be changed by Jesus, to be commanded by Christ. Some people might think, well, that sounds cumbersome and oppressive, but to me, it sounds like freedom. To know that I'm commanded by a righteous and loving and self-sacrificing Lord. And what he says to me and what he says to us who have experienced his love is not to love like the world, but to love like God loves us. That God loved Jesus so much that he told him everything and Jesus loves us so much that he tells us everything. And he illustrated, he said, you know, you don't tell a slave all your business. You may love a slave, a slave might faithfully serve. In Jesus' day, being a slave was not all bad. There were some slaves that were so attached to the families that they were indispensable. Some were physicians, some were teachers, some were instructors, some were accountants. You appreciated a slave. You took care of a slave. You had a relationship with a slave. You may even love a slave, but you don't tell a slave the master's business. And that's exactly what Jesus tells us, that we're no longer just a servant or a slave, but we're a friend because he's told us the secrets of the family business. And the secret of the family business of God is to love each other the way Jesus loves us. It's been several decades ago. I'd read some stories and there was a National News, NBC News special report done several years ago on a man who had survived um, some of the terrible death camps, especially the one in Auschwitz, Poland. In February of 1941, there had been Jews and gypsies and foreign folk and priests 
who had been rounded up, those who sought to uh, speak against the Third Reich, those who protected those who were sought for extermination. And a Franciscan priest by the name of Maximilian Kolbe was put in the, the, the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. And he'd been there for months, and as the, the occupation and the war draw, draw, drew on, some men would get desperate. But they were cautioned not to try to escape. And the terrorism of the Nazis had told the men, if anybody tries to escape, whether they're successful or not, 10 prisoners will die for every person that tries to escape. One man was overcome by grief and loss of hope, and he, so he ran for the fence, began to climb the fence, and he was machine gunned to death. And sure enough, the commander came and said, for that escape attempt, attempt, 10 will die, and they simply called 10 to come out of line. And there was one Polish Jew, Frandyshek Gesevnacek, was there, and he cried out, wait, I have a wife and children. And without hesitating, this priest, Maximilian Kolbe, stepped forward and said, I will take his place. Well, the Nazi guards didn't care that just as soon a man who was calm would take the place of a man who was hysterical. And for this particular punishment, they marched them all into a cell, 10 prisoners, where Colby managed to live until August the 14th. But these men were condemned to die by exposure and starvation. And he did. By this time, the news interviewers realized that Gasovnicek was 82 years old and they'd visited him in his home in Poland and they were filming him. And as they went around his humble little white house, he came to this marble. It seemed out of place. This little marble monument inside his home, carefully arranged with, flesh, uh, with fresh flowers. And the inscription read, In memory of Maximilian Kolbe, he died in my place. Every day since 1941, Gasovnicek says he's lived with the knowledge, and I quote him in saying, I live because someone else died for me. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down their lives for our friends. Folks, this is the love of God. This is the secret of the kingdom that Jesus has imparted to us. It is his master's business. And we hear these stories, and I'm moved by them, inspired by them. I've not yet been called to die physically for a friend. Don't know if I will. You don't know if you'll be called to do that. But sometimes... Laying down our life for our friends, though it may not be physical, it might simply be compassionate. To put our own fears, our own purposes, our own pursuits on hold just enough to invite someone to hear about Jesus. To tell them that our love is made complete, that we have complete joy in this life when we understand that Jesus so loved us that he died on the cross for our sins. And people need to hear that. Sometimes laying down our life may not be the physical death, or it could be that we're called to do that, but it means to put behind the pursuits that we put out first in order to embrace the command of Christ, to love others as he has loved us. It is a moving love of Jesus. It moves us into right relationship with God. It moves us to know that we've gone from being slaves to friends, it moves us to want that kind of love and redemption and salvation for the people around us. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the moving love of Jesus. And I pray that that agape love, that greatest love that has ever been lived out, displayed, given to us, would be the kind of love, Lord, that we so cherish and celebrate as we worship you in spirit and in truth that would move us to love others with the love of Jesus. A love that will lay down our lives in order that we might share the good news of Jesus' love. And so, Father, I thank you for each here today 
for every person that revels in your love. And help us now to be moved to share this love with those that we go to work with, to serve with, to seek to become friends with, that they might become a friend of God. Bless us now, Lord, as we respond to your call of salvation and to service, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we invite you to salvation. And if you already experienced salvation, we invite you to serve others the way Jesus serves us. If you've never made peace with God, he so loves you that he died on the cross to pay the price for my sin and for yours. And the scriptures tell us that if anyone will call upon the name of the Lord and believe in faith in him, that will believe that he so loved you, he died on the cross for your sins, rose on the third day, and that he loves you. Romans 10, 9 says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing God raised him from the dead, my friend, you shall be saved. If you've never made peace with God, we invite you to come just as you are and to experience the moving love of God. Would you respond as we stand and sing to God's glory? Next Sunday, August 28th at 9.45 during the Sunday school hour, we'll be having a brunch. And that's for anybody who may be attending our church who wants to know more about the life and ministry, how to connect with First Baptist Church, how to become a member. We want you to be at that brunch next Sunday. So you'll, if you'll see me, let me know you're coming. We'll have lots of great food for those who may be interested in finding out more about First Baptist Church. I want you to join me in our benediction this morning as we praise God for the great things he has done as we share together and sing in the doxology. Mm -hmm. 